Hi everybody, it's Thomas here from thomasfitzgeraldphotography.com. In this video, I'm going to look at Apple's Aperture. Now, Aperture was discontinued a few years ago, but recently uh, I decided to open it up again just to have a look. And um, it was actually for a project. I was trying out files from Irradiant X Transformers just to see how they'd look in Apple's Aperture, and uh, it turns out pretty good. But I'm not going to get into that today because uh, what I discovered while using it was it's actually still a really good application and it made me realize that there's uh, quite a few things that I miss from it. If you're not familiar with Aperture, Aperture was kind of Apple's version of Lightroom um, and they discontinued it a few years ago. It actually came out before Lightroom, so Lightroom is basically Adobe's version of Aperture, <laughs> to be more accurate. It was actually the first application that came up with the whole kind of photo workflow thing. So before that, you had separate applications for your asset management and your photo manipulation. So Aperture was the first application to put the two of these together uh, and to create this all-in-one that we now kind of take for granted. I used to use Aperture all the time. It was my main application until I eventually switched to Lightroom when they discontinued it. Um, Apple hadn't really updated it in a few years before they did discontinue it, so it was the technology was beginning to get old and you were missing things like lens corrections, uh, a few other things, um, which was a real shame because people love this application. And when you look back at it now, you can see why. It, in some ways, is still way better than the competition. And that's from an application that was discontinued a good few years ago now at this point. So uh, while I was going through it, um, it made me realize that there were some things, some features that I really missed. And so here are my top five. So number one is import speed. Uh, importing files into Aperture is pretty fast and they have uh, some ni nice tricks, uh, which I will show you now. So I have a card in my card reader, so I'm going to hit import and we have all the files here. Now I have shot RAW and JPEGs um, and I'm going to import both. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to use JPEGs as the original but I'm actually importing both and I will get into this more in the next section. But uh, I'm gonna create a new project and call this test and then just hit import. Now, for a second there, you're kind of going, wait, what, did that work? Uh, because mm -hmm. that was almost instant. And I am importing these off a card reader onto my hard drive and already most of them are there. And not only that, but I can see them full res. Um, I'm not waiting for previews to generate. These are the images straight off the card almost instantly. And not only that is, it's actually still importing them. If I look down here, you can see it's copying the files. See, it's still actually copying the files, but <laughs> you can view them straight away. This is really impressive. Um, and if you are in a hurry, you're a sports shooter or something, or you're a news shooter and you're trying to make a deadline, this is a huge advantage. Um, and also browsing, like just browsing through the files is really fast. I'm not waiting for things to load. Uh, not only that, but you've got full res previews here as well. So I can zoom in and I can see, but yeah, so that's pretty much the first thing that's import speed. As you can see, it's pretty fast. On to number two. And number two is raw and JPEG handling. Now. The way Aperture handled RAW and JPEG pairs is, in my opinion anyway, still the best out there of any application. When you're importing, uh, you can choose how they are grouped, um, which to use as the primary, and uh, switching between them is really easy as well. So if I go back to my import dialog box here, you can see over here we have RAW plus JPEG pairs. And this lets, lets, you, know, uh, lets you choose how to handle it. So you have both use raw use jpeg as original and both use raw as original so what this does is it imports both the raw and jpeg files groups them together and then sets the primary as to whichever one you set here you can also go both uh, separate so this will import them and you'll see both of them in your project uh, as separate images you can import just the jpegs and you, you could or you can import just the raw files and one of the cool things is if you just import jpegs um, you can then go back and re-import the matching RAW files and it'll group them up. So the other part is uh, you can uh, batch change them. So if you look at the way, uh, say, Apple Photos, it still handles RAW and JPEG files similarly, except you don't have no choice over it. It will always import and set the JPEGs as primary. And to change them, you have to do it in the edit mode and uh, you can only do it one at a time. Whereas in Aperture, you could actually batch change them. So I can go down here and go use RAW as original. And this will now switch all of these to using raw. So if I go back into this now, it's now using the raw. And you can see that down here on the little or. And 
and then I can go ahead and start manipulating. So that was one of the great features of it and I really wish other applications would use this method because sometimes it's handy to have both and it's handy to be able to switch between both and uh, you can use your RAWs to quickly go through your image or sorry you can use your JPEGs to quickly go through your set of images and pick out your ones and then for images that you want to work on specifically you can quickly switch to RAW uh, you don't have to jump through any more hoops um, so yeah so that was number two okay number three is no switching modules so in, if you're familiar with Lightroom um, or even Apple Photos, when you want to edit, you have to switch into the edit mode on Photos or the develop module in Lightroom. Whereas in Aperture, there's no modes. Everything is always the same. So even though I can switching panels up here, these are just panels in the adjustments. Um, so your images are always live, always editable. Um, you can bring up a second panel and you can actually see both. So I can be... I can see my info here um, and be using my adjustments over here at the same time. A lot of people preferred this uh, about Aperture at the time when both applications were still being sold um, and it was one of the reasons that many Aperture fans still say that they love Aperture um, and I can see why it's it's so much better. Uh, of the current applications out there, Capture One kind of works similar to this. It doesn't have modes either, um, but even Apple Photos now has a separate edit mode, which is kind of a pain. Um, but yeah, so that was one of the great things about it, and uh, it's one of the things I miss as well. So next up is my absolute favorite feature of Aperture, and the feature that I miss the most, and that is Extended Range Curves. Extended Range Curves is another Aperture feature that I haven't seen implemented in any application since Aperture. Um, Basically, Aperture works internally in 32-bit, and you can actually see values above 100% on the curves, and you can manipulate them. It allows you to work with clipped information, and, well, you could use, say, recovery to bring this back, um, which is kind of how Aperture used to do its highlight recovery. By using the curves, you can actually manipulate the data to how you want it, and you can control the roll-off and make things look much more film-like. So let me give you an example. In this image here, you can see the sky is gone. It's completely white. And if I look down here, you can see I could use recovery to bring some of this back, which is fine, um, but it's not great. So if I turn on curves, you can see down here, I have range set to extended. So let me just go to normal for a second. So this is your normal value, a normal RGB value. So there is black and there's 100% white. So if I go to extended, you can see the light gray area is your normal image value and then all this is above this down here that is the information that's been clipped so you can see there's all this information in the sky that you can't see but it is actually in the raw file so if i drag this over as you can see i'm bringing it all back in okay so that shows you just how much information is actually in that file and because it's a curve i can manipulate it like any other curve so i can do things like this So now, instead of it just being a harsh clip, I'm rolling off ever so gently towards the highlights and you end up with a nice bright sky and it's almost film-like. And one of the other cool features of curves in Aperture was you could actually add multiple curves. So I can add a new curves adjustment. And for this second one, I'm going to leave it set to standard range because in my extended range curve here, I've brought all the information back into the normal visible range, but I can use this now to then do things like add contrast. And the advantage of this is, is you can control the tone of the image. You can control how this looks and you can get it exactly the way you want it. And uh, it's actually a surprisingly valuable tool. Um, it's the one thing I really, really miss. Okay, so finally we have metadata handling. So let me just get back out of this image for a minute. And so if I select, say, a bunch of these flowers, for example. Now, if I go over here to info, this is kind of the general information panel um, where you've got things like caption, keywords, and so on, like you'd find in any application. However, we've got lots of different views, again, much like you have in Lightroom. So we can change things we'd want to see. Um, however, you can actually edit these views and you can customize them and add in what inf information that you want to see. There's a whole bunch of information that you can add. So here's one, for example, I have made where I have added almost everything into it. So you can see lots of information about your image. But there's more. You can also batch change metadata. 
Now again, this is something you can do in Lightroom by syncing uh, your changes across your images. However, this does one extra little trick. So let me just give you an example. Um, and I'm going to go batch change. So what I want to do is say, I'm going to start by adding a caption and we'll call this purple flowers. And hit OK. So now I've added purple flowers to all of these. But say for example, I wanted on a few of these. So, so I know there's a bee buzzing around. So I want to say bee buzzing around, but I already, I want to keep purple flowers. So I can go back to change again. And I can go B, B. And when I hit append up here, what this will do is this will add it to the end of the current caption. So like so. So now you can see purple flowers be buzzing around. You can't do this in Lightroom without a plugin. There is actually a plugin for it. If you look on my blog you, you, and search for it, you'll find it. But again, this is one of the really useful things about Aperture and uh, one of the things that I miss. And that's pretty much it for my top five. Um, there's a lot and lots more I could talk about. Um, I could go on indefinitely about it. It's a real shame that Apple didn't continue it because it is an excellent application. Even now, three years later, it's still working perfectly. Um, there's the odd little bug on it, but yeah. So that's pretty much it. That's my look back at Aperture. Um, I'm going to have another video next week where I will look at using um, Fuji files processed with X Transformer in Aperture. And I think you will be pleasantly surprised because the results are really, really good. And uh, yeah, so I probably will actually start using this again. So anyway, I hope you liked this video and, and found it informative. Um, if you do, click the like button below and give it a thumbs up because it helps other people find this video. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. Um, I also have a Patreon page if you like this and want to support the work that I do, both here on my YouTube channel and on my blog, and you want to help me keep making videos like this and make even better videos, you can subscribe to my Patreon channel and you will get extra content behind the scenes so, and so on and you'll also help us keep uh, making videos like this and also making more great content on the blog. So thank you for watching and I will see you next time.